Romans chapter 13. Just remain standing. Romans chapter 13. All right, this is message number three. And there will be one more, and that will be next Sunday. So there will be a total of four messages in this series on Romans chapter 13. All of these are online, and they can be viewed for free. And if somebody wants to download them, either on an audio file or a video file, they can do that for a small cost. And when we finish this series, uh, I'm going to get with these guys and see if perhaps we can get this on a DVD for people as well, because this this series has got to go out uh, to to the country. And... um, so help, help us promote that. Feel free to send people to the website, chuckbaldwinlive.com, and they can download this and they can view this, and I hope that many, many people will. We've already had a lot of people that have, that have downloaded copies, and uh, more are doing that every day. But this is message number three. All right, let's, again, let's read it. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. We covered verse 1 on the first week. Whosoever therefore, and by the way, we also looked at verses 3 and 4 in week number 1 as well. Last week we looked at verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. We will revisit that verse next week. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And we talked about both of those verses in, in uh, week one quite, a, quite extensively. Every injunction throughout Scripture uh, telling us to submit to God-ordained authority also includes a description of what God-ordained authority is. And we see that here in this text in verses 3 and 4. Now verse 5 is going to be our text for today. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Let's read that again. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, not only because you're afraid of the wrath of disobedience, but also for conscience' sake. All right, you may be seated. Biblical submission must consider one's conscience. One of the philosophers of the founding era said this, conscience supposes a knowledge of the law, and particularly of the law of nature, which being the primitive source of justice is likewise the supreme rule of conduct. Close quote. Conscience, reasoning, the thing that separates the individual person from the animal kingdom. We are created in the image of God with a body, soul, and spirit. It is this distinction that separates us from the rest of God's creation. In Hebrews chapter 5, turn your Bibles and with me if you would to Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to be looking at several scriptures today as we do every week because we have to compare scripture with scripture. No scripture is of any private interpretation. We have to see what the totality of God's word says about any subject, including this one. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 
this this exercising of the senses is the thing that allows us to reason. It is the thing that allows us to reach conclusions regarding what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, what is proper or what is improper. It is this reasoning ability of man. It is this conscience of man that separates us from brute beasts and allows us to look at, at matters from a moral perspective and to gain insight into our behavior accordingly. One cannot separate the moral quality of internal conscience from his external response to actions reasonably known to be wrong. Without reference to one's conscience of justice based on God's laws is to reduce God's creation to those of beasts that have no ability of wisdom and discernment. But the Bible says in Job chapter 35 verses 10 and 11, But none saith, Where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night, who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth, and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven? Do you see that? God made us wiser than the beasts. He gave us wisdom. He gave us discernment through our ability to reason and through our conscience. Go back to Romans chapter 13. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, not only because of you're afraid of the consequences, but because of conscience. God has given to us a conscience. That's why we have a court system, which is to judge the, the appropriateness of our conduct and to gauge through a conscientious, reasoned action the guilt or innocence of someone's conduct. If we were but brute beasts, if we were but animals without conscience, without the ability to reason, there would be no need for a court of law. There would be no need for a justice system. Everything in our society is predicated upon the fact that as men and women, we have been given a conscience. And as a result, we are held accountable for how we conduct ourselves according to the moral laws of God's natural laws. Let me give you an example. The, we all know that animals will oftentimes kill other animals for food. And uh, so I, I hear a lot of these uh, naturalists uh, talk at length about that and the cycle of life and, and all that. I'm not here to argue that. But have you considered, have you considered this? It is a fact of nature that many times a male lion, after a lioness will just give birth to her cubs, in order to force the lioness to become available to his sexual advances on her will eat, or actually, let me rephrase that, will not eat, but will kill the cubs. Kill the cubs, not for food, not for survival, but simply to force the lioness to go back into a state whereby she will entertain his sexual advances. Now that kind of activity goes on in the natural kingdom every day. In various animals, in various circumstances, to various degrees. Now, no one holds that male lion accountable for that conduct. 
No one seeks to hunt out the male lion that has just brutally and heartlessly, cold-bloodedly killed his own offspring. Not to survive, not to, uh, not to uh, eat so that he can live, but simply to enforce a, 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 a natural law by which he can go ahead and copulate with the lioness again. But no one holds the male lion morally accountable for that action. Why? Because he's an animal. He lacks soul and spirit. He lacks the inner consciousness which God has given to mankind. Now, what would society do with a man who would conduct himself in that manner? What would we do with a human being who would kill his own offspring, who would cold-bloodedly murder his own offspring? Would there not be accountability? Amen. Would there not be a societal reaction to that conduct? And would there not be a court action to hold this individual accountable for what society knows to be immoral conduct? Amen. Why don't we do that for the lion? Because again, God has made man in his own image with a conscience, with a, a reasonable ability to understand, to adjudicate justice, and to know the difference between right and wrong. It is manifest enough, according to the philosopher Hobbes, that when a man receiveth two contrary commands and knows that one of them is God's, he ought to obey that and not the other, though it be the command even of his lawful sovereign, close quote. If you are given two commands and you know that one is lawful according to your conscience and you know that the other is unlawful according to your conscience, which law are you obligated to obey? The law that is lawful according to your conscience. Because God has given to every man a knowledge of good and evil, a knowledge of right and wrong, and that is called natural law. And so we know instinctively that certain things are wrong and certain things are right. Certain things are evil and certain things are good. And we are responsible to conduct ourselves accordingly. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 9, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In this verse, God's commandment, that it's unlawful to steal, necessarily confirms private property rights. Amen? It, 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 it infers that God has appropriated the rightness of private property rights. If, if God has said in his word, thou shalt not steal, it infers that a man has a right to be secure in his person, in his property, in his effects, in those things which are his. Any effort then of theft against what God has established as proper and right in this particular discussion, personal property, any one or anything including government, that steals what rightly belongs to a man has violated the moral conscience of God. If individuals do not have the right to steal one another's property, then a collection of individuals known as government does not have the right to steal one another's property. Upon this principle of God, government is equally bound to the laws of God, and anyone who suggests otherwise 
promotes evil. Anybody who suggests that government has the right to violate the conscience of man and the natural laws of God is, is being more than uh, passively non-resistant. They are actually promoting evil. I, I love this quote by uh, the philosopher Bowden who said, Absolute power only implied freedom in relation to positive or man-made laws and not in relation to the law of God. God has declared explicitly in his law that it is not just to take or even to covet the goods of another. Those who defend such opinions that the prince is not bound to the law of God are even more dangerous than those who act on them because they show the, law, the lie in his claws and arm princes under a cover of just claims, close quote. In, in other words, the people and the preachers across America today who allow the would-be tyrant to usurp the rights of man and the just laws of God are in many ways worse than the tyrant because without the complicit conduct of the citizenry, and especially in our day and time, the preachers, the tyrant would not be able to accomplish his evil machinations. Amen. So it's more than just toleration. It's more than passivity. It is a, it is a, it is a equal guilt in crime committed. And, and that's what's happening today uh, throughout America, is people are facilitating the improper conduct of those in a position of, of, of power or authority, and thus allowing them to abrogate the natural law principles of God, which is an affront not only to the conscience of man, which God created. It is, a, it is an affront to the very conscious and heart of God because we are made in God's image. Can you say amen there? Amen. Upon this same principle, God similarly demands that society's currency and commercial system be just. You say, you mean you can have a just, you mean is there such a thing as a just money system? Is there such a thing as an unjust money system? Amen. You bet there is. If there is such a thing as stealing and thievery and misappropriation of monies, etc., then that necessitates an unjust system of, of monetary uh, uh, expenditure or, or uh, even the attainment of such. Either way, it's unjust. Well, if something is unjust, then there has to be a counter to that. There must be some, if something is unjust, then something must be what? Just. If there is an unjust system, there's got to be a just system. What does the Bible say? Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 36. Listen to this. Just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and just hen shall ye have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Just weights. Just balances, just money, and, and we'll we'll talk about this in the weeks to come. But another real problem that we have, uh, not only in America but all over the world. But 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 let's talk about America. One of the real problems that we have today is that we are uh, many times our our powers that be in the in the commercial world and in the political world and yes even in the religious world are facilitating an evil money system, an evil money system. And we are laboring under this evil money system, this unjust, unequal, out of balance money system that is producing many of the economic problems that you and I are dealing with today. A lot of it has, it's, it's not near as much to do with whether it's a Republican or a Democrat in the White House or the Congress, and it has more to do with the acceptance by Main Street as well as Wall Street with an evil, corrupt money system. And uh, we can thank a lot of that to the Federal Reserve System that we're now dealing with. 
I'll just say it point blank. The, e the Federal Reserve System is an evil, corrupt monetary system. And we will get into that in some, of the, in some of the weeks to come, and we'll show you why we say that. But all must comply with God's standard. And every soul must answer to God and his fellow man for all of his actions regarding submission based upon this objective standard. Now take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2. And let me show you a passage here. Romans chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15. Somebody saw me taking a drink of water one day. And they said, that's the only windmill I ever saw run by water. <laughs> Romans chapter 2. Look at verses 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, underline that, have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their, what? Hearts. Their conscience. We're talking about being subject to the higher powers, not only because of fear, but also because of conscience. The conscience must submit. The conscience must recognize the rightness of that law. Show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their, what? Conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. God has written in our hearts Amen. the natural laws of God. Amen. Whether there was a law prescribed by man or not, right is still right, and wrong is still wrong. Amen. It is wrong to steal from one another whether there is a law prohibiting it or not. Why? Because there is a law written in our hearts. There is a law in our conscience that says it's not right to steal from my fellow man. Amen. Okay? When human laws refute natural notions of justice, those who submit to those laws place that human institution above the authority of God. If you tell me that I must submit to an unjust law when my conscience tells me this is not a just law, not deserving of submission, you are saying that the law is a higher power than the Creator who gave law to man. Now think about this matter of the natural law before the written law. Uh, my mind goes back to the Old Testament story of the book of, Cain, a book of Genesis, the, the story of Cain and Abel. The first murder in human history. Cain killed his brother Abel. You all know the story. There was no written law when Cain killed Abel. Right? There was no Ten Commandments. There was no U.S. Constitution or Montana Constitution or Bill of Rights or Declaration of Independence or Magna Carta or Articles of Confederation. There was no written law but Cain killed his brother Abel in a premeditated homicide. And what happened? God put a mark on Cain 
identifying him as a murderer, meaning there was a, a justice system in place where God held Cain accountable for his homicide even before there was a law that was written down that said, Cain, thou shalt not kill. But Cain knew he shouldn't kill. Why? Because there was a law written where? In his heart. In his conscience. Since man cannot serve both God and man, this inevitable conflict always forces people to choose between following God or unjust government. The crux of such choice naturally being defined by the righteous laws God created for our good, juxtaposed to the unjust laws government creates for our destruction. God universally gave to the human race a conscience not to slavishly obey just because a command has been given but to apply the knowledge and wisdom of God's laws in all circumstances of life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 is a very important verse. I'm not going to have you turn to it, but I encourage you to write it down. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In other words, keep your heart, your conscience... Right. Make sure your heart and conscience are clean according to the natural laws of God because every decision you make in life is going to stem from that good conscience or that defiled conscience, as the case may be. And let's face it, there are many people... In, in government, not just in civil government, but you can church government, commercial government, uh, all kinds of government, who are operating with a defiled conscience. When a man's conscience becomes defiled, what means he has rejected the natural law principles of God. And by the way, This transcends spirituality. There are many professing Christians who are operating with a defiled conscience. And there are many unbelievers who live with a clean conscience. It doesn't, in this regard, it doesn't matter whether one is a Christian or not. God has given to all men, naturally, a conscience with the laws of God written in our hearts. And when men reject, repudiate, and resist that natural law, their conscience becomes defiled. There's another word in the Bible that says seared conscience, a seared conscience, as is with a hot iron. They don't feel the guilt. They don't feel the shame. They don't feel the, the, the conviction of wrongdoing in their heart anymore. Let me tell you, woe be to anyone who in one way or another is required to follow a person with a defiled conscience. Because Jesus said, when the blind lead the blind, what happens? Both fall into the ditch. And that's what happens when you follow follow someone with a defiled conscience. And you better be careful that you don't allow someone who has a defiled conscience to defile your conscience. If you're not careful, you will follow him to his destruction and yours. That's why the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence. Guard it. Guard that conscience. Guard that heart. Because every decision you make in life, all the issues of life are going to come out of that conscience. Let me show you another verse in that regard that I think will help illustrate what we're talking about. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 13. 
Hebrews chapter 13. And this is a very important verse relative to church government. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey them. Okay, this is again, this is talking about submission. Just like 13, Romans 13, talking about submission to authority. So is this verse. It's just a different authority. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit. Same word. Submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable to you. This is speaking to the, to the believer submitting to the spiritual authority of the man of God in the church. All right? So he's saying, okay, submit to that spiritual leadership from that man of God. He's, he's watching for your soul. He must give an account for his leadership within the church. And you want him to be able to give a joyful report before God and not a grievous one. Now, that's a very familiar verse to many of us. But the next verse is seldom discussed. Look at verse 18. After just saying to the church, Obey them that have the rule over you, the spiritual overseer. The next, very verse, the next verse, Paul says, if he's the author, and I think he is, Pray for us, the spiritual leader. For we trust we have a what? Good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. So as you submit to spiritual authority, you need to pray for that spiritual authority, to, be, to pray that God will allow them and help them to always maintain a good conscience so they might live honestly and lead the people of God honestly. Well, this indicates, or at least infers, that it's possible for spiritual leaders to have a corrupt conscience, and their conscience seared and defiled, and therefore not live honestly before the people, in which case, should you still submit? Should you still submit? No. Then why should you still submit when the civil authority does not lead you in good conscience and in honesty? Amen. Where God commands that one submit to another, He always qualifies that command. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians Chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and verse 16. You got it? That ye submit yourselves unto such. Submit, same word, same Greek word. Submit yourself. Hebrews 13, one. submit to higher powers, same word. Submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that, what? Helpeth us and laboreth. Submit to the person that helps us. It's not a blanket, universal, unconditional command in, in, in chapter 16 of verse 16. Chapter 16. It is a conditional command. Submit yourselves one to another unto the ones that labor, unto the ones that help. What about the ones who destroy? What about the ones who harm? Are you supposed to submit to them? That's not what he said. And what did he say? Back, go back to Romans 13, 13, our text. What did he say in 13? Submit every, every soul subject to the higher powers, all right, verse 3, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. There's your qualification. Verse 4, he is the minister of God to thee for what? Everybody. For what? For good. But if thou which is evil would be afraid, he bear not sword in vain. Again, the qualification. Every time you see, same thing in Peter, we've already given you that verse earlier. Every time you see the command to submit, there's also the qualification that this leadership 
and submission is based upon the good natural law principles that God has given to every man in his heart and conscience. That's why in verse 5, that you should needs be subject not only for wrath, because of fear of wrath, but also for what? Conscience sake. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a, there it is again, what? Good conscience. Good conscience. The end of the end of the commandment the end of the commandment is charity out of a good conscience you see that the end of the commandment the end of the commandment is not the law it is not the sword it is not the force the brute force behind the law it is the good conscience the pure heart and faith unfeigned look at verses 8 through 10 this this is this is great i hope you're getting this i hope i, hope, I really do write this down revisit this when you're talking with people these uh roman thir- romans 13 misinterpreters uh look at this But we know that the law is good, period. Period. Right or wrong? If a man use it, what? Lawfully. So if a man does not use the law lawfully, is the law good or bad? Tell me. Absolutely. The law is good if a man use it lawfully. Same thing is true in our country today, uh, my dear people. The Constitution is good if the powers that be use it lawfully. But there's a lot of people in government today that are misusing the Constitution, they're not using it lawfully, they're abusing it unlawfully. And when they do so, their law that they try to coerce and force upon us is not constitutional regardless of what the Supreme Court of the United States says. That's why we need a governor and that's why we need a state that will be willing to do what Jan Brewer did down there in Arizona, but take it one step further and say, we don't care what the Supreme Court of the United States says. We in Montana or Arizona, we are going to do what is right and what is lawful according to the laws of this state. You're not using the law lawfully. You're not using the Constitution constitutionally. And our conscience will not allow us to submit. That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. That's what it was about in 75 and 76. That's what it's about today. Verse 9, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, A righteous man doesn't need the law. A righteous man who is led by the laws of God, written in his heart, written in his conscience, he's not going to steal from his neighbor because his heart, his conscience won't let him do it. The law is made for those guys over there who have a defiled conscience and they're going to steal every chance they get. For the ungodly, for sinners, for profane and murderers and so forth. For whoremongers, verse 10, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And notice, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. 
when the law is used unlawfully, it is by definition not ordained of God. And one's conscience would and should require him not to submit. This would be especially true when the authority would provide no means of redress in a meaningful and timely manner. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're right there anyway, verses 18 and 19. Let me show you this. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a, what? Good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, and I could name a few myself. There is another verse relative to this, and that's in the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1. These are the protégés of, of Paul, Timothy and Titus. And he's writing to both of them, and he says some similar things in, in each of these letters. In Titus chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, I, I, I like the way he says it here even better. We looked at these verses earlier in a previous message, verses 10 through 12. Verse 13, this witness is true. What is that? The Christians are liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Remember we talked about men reducing themselves to the stature of beasts through their hardness of heart to the laws of God. Remember that? And and men ruling the powers that be ruling as brute beasts. What? How does a brute beast rule? By brute force. I was. Uh, well, I was excited when one of the. I hadn't been here in Montana very long, and I was driving up the the, the mountain uh, to go to our home, and and I, I've been taking a camera with me uh, going up and down because I'm seeing wildlife everywhere. And I just love, I love it. And so I'm taking pictures all over the place. And this one day I didn't have my camera. Oh, wouldn't you know it? There was a 10-point buck and an 8-point buck, both white-tailed deer, fighting. Now, I've seen videos of that, but I've never seen it in the wild myself, right off the road. And they were going at it. And man, I stopped the truck and I'm reaching for my camera. And it's, oh, I didn't bring my camera. And so I sit there and I watch, and they were oblivious to me. I mean, I'm sitting there. I mean, I was 25, 30 feet away from these deer. And they were just, I mean, they were going at it. And I, I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, there's got to be, there's got to be a female around her somewhere. And I'm looking really around. And sure enough, over underneath some, some low hanging limbs, there was a doe just laying down, just chewing her cud. It was like <laughs> she could not have cared less just what was going on. And then I look over to the side, and there was a smaller buck, like it looked like about, about a four-point buck. And then there was another buck, another maybe four, five, six-point. So there was four bucks. And there's one doe laying down, and these other bucks... You know, they were, these two other, the little bucks, they were watching these two big bucks fight. And the, you know, the, the, the 10 point and the 8 point, they were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then whenever, you know, maybe they thought they were getting tired or something, I don't know, the, the smaller bucks, they would come in like they were going to join the fight. And then the two bigger bucks would quit fighting each other, and they would run the two little bucks away. <laughs> and then they'd go fighting each other again. I sat there in my truck and watched them for 20 minutes. I kid you not, 20 minutes. Finally, the bigger buck got the best of the slightly smaller buck and ran him away. And then he goes over there and the doe stands up and then I left. <laughs> I didn't want to disturb him. Brute force. Brute force. Brutish beasts 
only know brute force. And when men defile their conscience and they have no longer the ability to discern right from wrong in their heart because they have violated the natural law given to them at creation by God, they rule as brute beasts. In other words, by brute force. And if the only reason that we submit to such leaders is brute force, then we have reduced ourselves to nothing but brute beasts. The thing that separates us from the beasts when it comes to submission is not brute force. It's not might makes right. It is conscience, heart, reason. Wait a minute. Yeah, I know you're bigger than me, and I know that you're stronger than me, but what you're doing is not right, and I will not submit to it. That's what makes men men. And that's what makes subjects citizens. Men who yield power with a defiled conscience in violation of God's laws reduce their status to beasts. The force of the strongest person in society, whether in the name of government, authority, or any other, has nothing to do with rightness, justice, or conscience. Rightly stated, obligation to submit is not mindless or slavish. It is based upon sound and proper reasoning as understanding by God's natural and revealed laws. To unconditionally submit to whoever possesses the strongest power at the time epitomizes a forward person who is carried by the wind, which is the quality of a less than wise person. Scripture says concerning those holding such a philosophy and practice of life, and this is found in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man whose ways are crooked and they forward in their path. Do you see that? Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. To absolutely obey any earthly authority without regards to one's conscience and what's right and wrong is as great of a distortion of divine command that one wonders how any person using reason and wisdom could subscribe to that notion. The force of government can by no means change God-imposed duties which exist immutably where government does not exist. For as has been rightly noted, and this is what Rousseau said, if we must obey perforce, there is no need to obey because we ought And if we are not forced to obey, we are under no obligation to do so. In other words, if there is no natural law, if there is no heart, if there is no conscience, then the only thing that's right is what some government says is right, and the only thing that's wrong is what government says is wrong. And so that are you telling me that if government doesn't say something is wrong, that that means there's nothing wrong? So in Cain's case... I guess God was unjust to banish him and punish him because there was no law that said thou shalt not murder. Right? Because a law does not state it, because a law does not prohibit it, does not mean it's right. And because a law allows it does not mean it's right or wrong. Let me rephrase that. If the law says it's so, they allow it, it's legal, that does not mean that it's right. And if the law prohibits it by dictation, that doesn't mean it's wrong.
it must bear witness with a conscience inbred by the very nature of God. To submit without regard to conscience violates the nature of God's creation and human life. And God's commandment, the submission to be given, is given when having put due thought into the matter. Knowing that God did not ordain all government, but only government which establishes his mandated qualifications. Let me give you another example. I'm coming to the close. I don't know how many of you saw Mel Gibson's classic movie of several years ago called Braveheart. In my opinion, it's a fantastic movie. I know there's a few scenes in it that I don't care for, but on the whole, is a classic film which depicts the inbred, natural right, conscience of man to live free. Do you remember the part when the king resurrected an old, and this is based on history, as was the film itself. When he resurrected the old medieval custom of just prima noctis, or in, in the English, that's the Latin for the law of first night. Night N I G H T, not K N I G H T. Just primus nocta, the law of first night. And, the, and what the, that law said, that law said was when a man and woman were married, the king had the right to sleep with the bride on her wedding night. And that was a medieval law that many kings of that era practiced and forced submission upon their subjects. That is depicted in the movie Braveheart. So all of you, Romans 13, submit to government no matter what, philosophers out there what if a modern day leader in the western world today were to try to resurrect just prima noctis and when your daughter or granddaughter became a man's wife the political leader was lawfully allowed and you were lawfully required to submit so that he might sleep with her the night of her wedding. Are you going to sheepishly throw Romans 13 in our face and say, submit to the higher powers. There's no power but of God. He that resisteth resisteth the ordination of God. And if anyone would claim such an absurdity, how many of us would respect that person even that much? You see, the absurdity of trying to base a scripture upon something other than the divine principles of God's word well established throughout the entire body of scripture did Moses violate God's law and God's principle of submission to authority when he killed the Egyptian taskmaster in defense of his fellow Hebrew did Elijah violate God's principle of submission to authority when he openly challenged Ahab and Jezebel Did David violate God's principle of submission to authority when he refused to surrender to Saul's troops? Did Daniel violate God's principles of submission to authority when he disobeyed the king's command to not pray aloud to God? Did the three Hebrew children violate God's principles of submission to authority when they refused to bow to the image of the state? Did John the Baptist violate God's principle of submission to authority when he publicly scolded King Herod for his infidelity? 
Did Simon Peter and the other apostles violate God's principle of submission to authority when they refused to stop preaching on the streets of Jerusalem? Did Paul violate God's principles of submission to authority when he refused to obey those authorities who demanded that he abandon his missionary work? In fact, Paul spent almost as much time in jail as he did out of jail. Remember that every apostle of Christ except John was killed by hostile civil authorities opposed to their endeavors. Church, Christians throughout church history were imprisoned, tortured, or killed by civil authorities of all stripes for, for refusing to submit to their various laws and prohibitions. Did all of these Christian martyrs violate God's principle of submission to authority? No. Of course not. That's why Paul said in Romans 13, 5, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Meaning our obedience to civil authority is more than just because they said so. It's also a matter of conscience. This means we must think and reason for ourselves regarding the justness and rightness of our government's laws. Obedience is not automatic or robotic. It is a result of both rational deliberation and moral approbation. And let's remember, too, while we're talking about authority, that in these United States of America, unlike nations around the world, the authority rests with we, the people. Amen. Through our Constitution, our Declaration, our Bill of Rights, and the people we elect who swear an oath to preserve, protect, and defend that Constitution, Declaration, Bill of Rights, by which they will be judged as well as we. Let's stand for prayer.